Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, staying on time. Um, our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, uh, our keynote uh, speaker. Uh, to introduce Dr. Qureshi, I take a moment. Uh, yeah, uh, for those of you who may not know this, uh, he is my mentor. He, I owe a lot of his uh, uh, work uh, and training and our uh, actual setup of the programs to his vision and uh, his mission of training uh, fellows and residents and uh, making them good neurologists, good stroke neurologists, uh, good neurointerventionalists, and good neurocritical care physician. Uh, this unique model of having a combined fellowship uh, was his idea, and uh, we've carried those ideas uh, through over the years. Um, um, for by way of introduction, also Dr. Qureshi is the first uh, neurologist who was trained in interventional interventional neurology um, by a team of neurosurgeons and neuroradiologists at Buffalo. Um, and uh, he was the only neurologist who was trained formally in 1990s and uh, was a pioneer in many ways of starting the field of interventional neurology. He was also one of the first neurocritical care fellows at Johns Hopkins University and was a pioneer in starting the neurocritical care society as well as uh, uh, making the neurocritical care field a reality. Uh, as a stroke physician, he has done um, uh, excellent work in organizing stroke societies, uh, the, the stroke conferences, and uh, um, taking stroke to a level where treatment options, acute treatment options became mainstream, hence changing the field of uh, and place of neurology. Uh, so we owe a lot uh, uh, to him for a lot of uh, forward thinking uh, work that he has done. He's also published extensively. He has written over 500 uh, papers, uh, peer-reviewed publications. He's one of the highest peer-reviewed uh, uh, publisher, uh, scientific uh, paper writer uh, from uh, neurology perspective, actually, he is the highest, I think. Uh, the couple of cardiologists who've probably written more papers than him, but uh, other than that, he remains the highest uh, uh, publishing neurologist. Uh, he's written many books, and one of these books are given, uh, have been given today, uh, signed by me, uh, to all of the presenters, all of the residents and fellows uh, on how to write a scientific manuscript. Uh, that is Dr. Qureshi's uh, uh, writing. Um, he he um, famously would uh, go on a weekend and to relax on the weekend, he would just write a paper and every weekend we had a new paper. Um, and you, you, you pretty much need that to write 500 papers that he has done over uh, his career. He is still young and energetic and keep on uh, breaking new grounds. At this time, he is working on a certification program uh, for uh, UCNS for interventional neurology. Uh, uh, so without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Qureshi to give uh, us um, a primer on how to write a scientific manuscript, how to, how to be successful in furthering our academic careers and how to do research. I think it would be extremely helpful for the residents and fellows to learn and to actually even stay in touch with him. I'm sure he'll be happy to help you and guide you just like he was a great mentor and guide for all of us that have trained with him. So please welcome Dr. Qureshi. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure anytime I'm doing anything with Jawad. I think Jawad is too humble. He's not telling us that he and I started this field together. <laughs> we were the first interventional neurology program with a training program at uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. So it was a very exciting time. <laughs> and times have definitely changed a lot. So what I do today is actually talk about scientific manuscript writing uh, for medical journals. And the first question everybody must ask themselves is, why should you even publish? What is there in it for you or for others in publishing? And I think that 
sharing of medical knowledge is an essential component of responsibility jointly shared by all physicians and it is a almost a mandate according to the profession that we have chosen and i think that the prompt and widespread dissemination of medical knowledge derived from a variety of sources uh, alert scientists and medical professionals to the potential of new areas of research and also facilitate training of new physicians and research but I actually want to give an example where medical knowledge was not disseminated in a timely fashion and its consequences all of you can see that picture down there and you will all recognize that that's the brooklyn bridge now one of the thing that we also there's a medical aspect of the brooklyn bridge uh, when the brooklyn bridge was being formed obviously the foundations of the bridge had to be done underwater so they had to go have people go underwater and actually set up those foundations and when those people would come up essentially a lot of them would develop vision loss stroke severe extremia extremia or extremity ischemia and nobody was understood what was going on and andrew smith was actually the physician who was there at the brooklyn bridge who was treating these patients and in 1873 he described 110 such cases although he had no idea how to treat them even the chief engineer also lost his vision because of this diving under the water and coming back up again however ironically a year before in france they already knew what was going on they also knew how to treat it so fried bread had already discovered that intravascular gas can actually be released because of rapid decompression and the treatment was simple put them back again put them down again and slowly bring them up and that would actually move the gaseous uh, or the nitrogen gas from a gaseous component back into the liquid component but friedberg did not publish his work and therefore people at the brooklyn bridge construction had no idea what they were dealing with and how best to treat it so i think that does actually tell you that there is an importance in sharing your observations in any format possible so that patients and humanity can benefit now ironically you know there is a lot of medical literature for sure but if you look at the medical literature almost 90% of the medical literature is actually published by only 10% of the medical professionals so i think that is suffice to say that most people do not publish now the question is why do 90% of the people do not ch or choose not to publish <clears throat> and i think there's two reasons for that one is actually the effort that's involved in preparing a manuscript you know we've had residents and medical students fellows for many many years and it's always surprised me that for them actually taking overnight calls taking two days straight on call has not bothered them as much as actually writing a scientific manuscript so it is actually the writing a scientific manuscript perhaps is even more cumbersome than actually taking call and also misplaced expectations So when people write manuscripts one of the challenges they have they don't really use an organized system or a template they're just trying to take all the thoughts they have and trying to put it together in some organized fashion that they don't even have clarity on how to organize it then the second thing is misplaced expectations everybody every resident fellow medical student attempted to write a scientific manuscript but their expectations are somewhat strange or you know somewhat disconnected everybody think they will submit a manuscript to the new england journal of medicine within two weeks they will let a get a letter saying that we are a distinct pleasure to accept your manuscript for the new england journal of medicine however most likely what they're going to be saying is that we regret to inform you your manuscript did not achieve a priority high enough for publication in school now somehow the reality is so discouraging that many people will not even attempt to resubmit that manuscript that they could have gone and accepted in another journal so i think that we have to set our expectations right from the beginning so that you know we can continue on this path which sometimes can be a tough path now manuscripts is not a 
single entity. It's actually a heterogeneous group of entity. You have original research, which means research that hasn't been published before. Even journals may actually request you to sign a document saying that you have not published this research before. And you can have full length manuscripts. You can actually have brief reports and research reports, which are actually smaller case series. And obviously then you have case reports. Now, most residents, fellows, medical students actually want to write a case report. And ironically, case reports are the hardest to get accepted because it's very rare to find an unusual presentation of a common disease. And essentially finding a new disease is even more uncommon. And in fact, your best chance really is to actually determine, identify a new treatment procedure, particularly if you're actually in the endovascular or neurocritical care field. Uh, but again, case reports are probably the hardest to publish and some journals don't even take case reports anymore. And then we have review articles, which actually are based on already published work. And it can be an overview. You are actually describing, and it's more of a quantitative analysis. You're actually describing various aspects of the disease. But most of our views are usually accepted from authorities in the field. So in somebody who's actually starting, maybe limited and actually get an opportunity to write an overview of a particular topic. Systematic reviews are getting more popular because there is actually an organization and how the literature was identified. The keywords, the search engines, and how many articles were identified and how many excluded and included in the end. And then meta-analysis is a truly a statistical process. It actually is losing statistical methodology to take the effect of a particular intervention and combining the effect over various studies. Now, when we first started publishing 25 years ago, there's no such thing as a registration. Who wants to register something before even they were published it? But in today's world, most journals require you register your work. So there is the clinical trials go, which actually has been, you know, the US National Library of Medicine has actually set it up based or for the National Institutes of Health. And any clinical trial that you're pursuing must be registered there. And now even observational studies and registries must be registered there. For observational study, you also have an option. Uh, you can actually use the World Health Organization registry network and you can register your study there as well. And even when you're writing reviews, now you have to register them as well. So there is this Prospero system, which is actually an international projected register of systematic reviews, and you have to register them there. So it's actually interesting that regardless of what you choose, you actually have to register that to actually add to the credibility of the work that you're trying to publish. And actually for clinical trials, the FDA recently penalized certain studies that actually were not registered or the updates were not registered on the clinical trial go. Now, for each type of study, there has been standardized algorithms that have been developed. So I think in the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of algorithms that are developed. You know, you also have the consort statement that's about clinical trials. You have the PRISMA that for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. You have the MOVES that actually is for meta-analysis, observational studies and epidemiology. You have STARD, which is actually for diagnostic accuracy studies. You have STROB, which is actually for reporting observational studies and epidemiology. And now even for case reports, you have CARE, which is a consensus-based clinical case reporting guidelines developer. So you, these are all documents that are in public access domain, a public domain, and you should benefit from them because it does actually allow you to understand the standardization process for the publication that you're gonna choose. So each publication starts with the title. And titles actually, you know, obviously you wanna bring the message there, but you can't put the whole message in the title, it will be too long. So you actually have to choose the components of the message that you want to put in there. For example, here is a title that habitual sleep pattern and risk of stroke and coronary artery disease. So obviously you have a study population of 7,844 adults. You have the variable of interest, which is sleep duration and daytime somnolescence. And then you have a 10 year follow up where you're actually ascertaining stroke and coronary artery disease. Obviously you cannot put it all in title. So you have to choose. 
So you can choose adults. You can choose habitual sleep pattern to reflect the variable of interest. And you can actually put the primary endpoint, which is the risk of stroke and coronary artery disease. And that's how you can compile a title. Now titles actually are not it's as simple. You can choose. For example, the title I showed you is a theme-based title. It really is talking about the study design and the question. Sometimes it can actually be a question-based title. For example, is intravenous TPA beneficial in patients with ischemic or infective endocarditis? So the title is actually a question. And sometimes it can be a finding-based title. The results are actually summarized in the title. For example, intravenous TPA is harmful in patients with infective endocarditis. So you've already summarized your finding in the title. For publication, I usually recommend a theme-based title. And for abstract, for a scientific meeting, I actually recommend a finding-based title because usually a person has to review thousands of abstracts and they don't have time to meticulously go over the content of the abstract. So the titles actually alert them to which abstract is more worthy of further consideration. Now, authorship, interestingly, is actually very important. Not just who you select as an author, but whoever you selected, you're using the right name, the right first name, the right middle initial, and the right last name. Because that's the only way somebody can retrieve their work. And even if you miss a middle initial in the name, it becomes harder to retrieve that publication. So for people starting, I would recommend choose the format that you want, the first name, the middle initial and the last name. Encourage people to have a middle initial because it will make it easier to identify their work and just use it consistently. And then who do you put, or whose name do you put on the publication? And you know, we always think that putting more people on the publication, it would be potentially beneficial. Almost that concept that many general now call as guest authorships. <laughs> Essentially, you're just a guest. You did not contribute at all. But I think one has to, understand the risk of putting somebody's name where they actually have not given the permission or not enthusiastic about, which is far more ominous in terms of disciplinary committees, as opposed to omitting a name of someone who actually really did not deserve to be in the author list as a st to start with. Now the abstract, and abstracts are actually important because a lot of time, many people are just reading the abstract. And here is like some example of that abstract. And essentially you can see that abstract actually usually structured. There was a time that some journals actually used unstructured abstract. So everything was just one paragraph, but most journals have moved away and they actually want headings. So when you're writing an abstract, I actually recommend using this template, background, methods, results, and conclusion. And below that, you can actually see what you need to put in there. I mean, for the background, most important is why are you doing this study? Is this an important question? The method actually talk about the design, the patient population, and obviously the analysis that you use. And then the results, obviously in an abstract, you can't put all the results in there. So you have to choose. What do you think is the most important message of your study? And only use those results in there. Um, you know, basically, sometimes people put about the baseline characteristics, how many people. Mean thing is, what is the primary result? What was your primary endpoint? And what was the quantitative estimate and comparison of the primary endpoint? And obviously, a conclusion, usually it has to be no more than two sentences. What is the summary? And then what are the implications? Are you implying that people should modify their practices? Are you implying that this question needs to be studied further? And then actually look at it, you can see the importance of a structured abstract. And essentially, I would recommend that you actually use these four subheadings to start with. Obviously, some journals may have a different set of subheadings and you may have to modify it. But if you have these four subheadings, it would be easier to take them into another structured abstract format. Now the introduction. Introduction actually can vary. Most of the time it's one paragraph, may actually be two paragraphs. Sometimes you have to introduce the topic. For example, in a journal that actually has broader audience, if you're writing something about stroke, you may have to introduce a little about ischemic stroke or the subtype of stroke. If you're submitting to the speciality journal, 
obviously many people will consider it insulting that you're trying to educate them about ischemic stroke. So it probably is not needed. The main thing in the study introduction, if you have to get one message, it's why is the study important? Why is it even necessary to do the study? Whether you actually chose a diagnostic study, interventional study review, you can actually mention it, what you're doing. But the most important thing is why you're doing the study. And sometimes you may actually want to put the study question in the introduction. But it's actually an important thing, broader recognition of importance. We all think that the study we are doing is the most important study. But is anybody else who actually think that it's an important study to do? Sometimes in the guideline statement, they would actually mention that these are the research questions that need to be studied. Sometimes in other publications, they would mention that these are the research questions that need to be studied. I strongly encourage you to cite those articles, particularly if there's a guideline, because then the reader, your reviewer knows that this is the question that other people have thought was an important question to address. So that's why you're addressing that question. Now let's talk about methods. So you have that introduction that's pretty much mandatory in every scientific publication. Now the methods. Now method actually, if we don't choose the structured format, it would be hard for you to capture everything that's necessary for the methods. So there's six subheadings I recommend. Study design, some basic components about the study design, a prospective study, clinical trial, retrospective study, observational prospective registry. Patient population, who are these patients? They're humans, they are actually looking at laboratory subjects. You're looking at normal people in the volunteers. Study intervention, and study intervention has to be described in detail. So when we use, you know, let's say, if you're using the term endovascular treatment, that probably is not enough. We have to actually say what kind of endovascular treatments are permitted. Uh, what was the parameter of the, you know, are you using a particular endpoint to use, or actually the intervention is directed to a particular endpoint. For example, two particular attempts or attempts until revascularization achieved. So that these things have to be specified. And also ancillary measures, because it seems like any intervention, the effect is modified depending on, on the ancillary care that they receive. So in it, somebody getting endovascular treatment, it's actually important to mention that what the systemic blood pressure parameters were, what the serum glucose parameters were, how long they were monitored in intensive care unit, what was the antithrombotic regimen used after the procedure because all of them can modify the results of the intervention. And then data collection. I think that we just mentioned data was collected, but it's actually important to mention who was collecting the data. If it's an independent organization, a CRO, a person who actually is not involved in the conduct of the study, it's always more helpful that somebody is looking at it from an independent viewpoint. And definition of endpoints. You know, many times I've seen, you know, we put an endpoint, let's say symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage is an endpoint. But without the definition, what is meant by symptomatic? Just any neurological deterioration? Are we talking about a neurological deterioration of four points or greater on the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale? Over what period of time, within 24 hours, within 72 hours? And then the hemorrhage, I mean, are we actually taking any hemorrhage are we actually saying it has to be confluent hemorrhage that is exerting a mass effect? So all of those parameters actually have to be specified. And sometimes in retrospective studies, you may not be able to specify, but then you have to acknowledge that, that you know, we use this particular information to determine that endpoint. And other thing is the completeness of follow-up. In a retrospective study, for example, there is no practical way, even with electronic medical record, that you can get information on everybody that was part of your data collection. So we actually have to mention what efforts were made, and in the end, what were actually the number that actually could not, the data collection was incomplete. And then statistical considerations. I think that in today's world, everybody knows some statistics. So every reviewer would have at least some level of statistical knowledge. So they have to put more emphasis on actually describing it. What is the statistical hypothesis? Saying endovascular treatment is greater than medical treatment or better than medical treatment is too vague. What do you mean in terms of better? 
Are we talking about reduction of death and disability as defined by a modified Rankine scale? And then reduction also has to be quantified. Are we saying that 10% or greater reduction, 5% or greater reduction? Because maybe 1% or greater reduction is not even valuable, but we, that would still meet the definition that endovascular treatment is better than medical treatment. So obviously the threshold or the magnitude that defines reduction also has to be specified. Now, even for retrospective studies, they're asking that you do sample size calculation. So you have to add sample size calculation, even for retrospective studies, that why did your sample size consist only of 100 retrospectively collected patients? Why not 500? Why not 25? And obviously, the method of analysis, whether your multivariate analysis, univariate analysis, all of that has to specify. And even now, the software you use, even if you're using Microsoft Excel, you have to actually mention the version of Microsoft Excel that you use in the statistical methods. Now we actually move to the results section. Obviously the results section is important because that is actually whatever you found and that would actually dictate whatever your discussion would be. So I actually recommend the following subheadings. You can actually start your results with subheading. You can delete the subheadings after it's all compiled, but it would look more organized that way. Subject identification. Every journal now for clinical trials are requiring, you have to mention how many patients you screened. So let's say you included 20 patients, but you probably screened over hundred patients. So you have to mention how many people were screened and how or why they were excluded. Even the retrospective study, you have to mention you screened 100 charts and only 25 people met the criteria and the 95 or 75 people who did not meet the criteria, why they did not meet the criteria. So this is something we have to actually put in there. And we always omit that, that what was the denominator before we started. And obviously the study population and what are the basic characteristics of a study population? Obviously you have to determine uh, the gender distribution, the age distribution and the clinical characteristic, the cardiovascular risk profile, because you know most of us are actually gonna publish in the cardiovascular disease domain. And also sometimes people want clinical and physiological characteristics. For example, what was the median NIS stroke scale? What were the physiologic parameters like systemic blood pressure, serum glucose? So those are some of the things that we have to mention. Now study intervention, you would actually say, we already talked about the study intervention in the method section. Why do you have to talk about it in the result section? Well, you may have actually contemplated a particular study intervention, but not everybody would have gotten that intervention. There's always a chance that some people did not require study intervention. Some people did not qualify. Some people pulled out and decided not to have the intervention. Some people crossed over, for example, from the medical group into the intervention group because they just didn't want to be in the medical group. So all of that has to be put in there that how many people actually got study information or intervention. And again, how many people are compliant with the protocol that is specified? You may have got an endovascular treatment, you may have received intravenous TPA, but instead of what was recommended, let's say you only got 0.8 milligram per kg. So how many people actually had non-compliant intervention or they were not compliant with the intervention obviously has to be placed in there. And the onus actually becomes greater if you're actually looking at a longer term intervention, even if you put people on antiplated agents and you actually specify six months of dual antiplated agents, a lot of people will not take it up to six months. A lot of people will be non-compliant and the onus is on the investigators to make sure that that compliance or non-compliance is mentioned so that actually the interpretation is easier. And again, the same applies for ancillary care. Some of these parameters may or may not have been upheld as specified in the method. So obviously you have to describe the endpoints. If you're describing modified Rankine scale, you have to describe the proportion of people who had a modified Rankine scale zero to two or zero to three. A lot of journals actually want you to specify 95% confidence interval as well to provide the precision of estimate. And again, what do I mean by description of endpoint? In the current world, we have cumulative endpoints. So what is a cumulative or an aggregate endpoint? So you can actually have, for example, let's say the sample study. The primary endpoint was any stroke or that within one month, 
or ipsilateral stroke to the side where the intervention was performed over the next two years. So any of these endpoints would have actually met the primary endpoint. But people actually want to know how many people actually had stroke within one month, how many people died within one month, and how many people had ipsilateral stroke over two years separately. And the classic example would be the CRESH trial, where you have a primary endpoint that was 7% in each group, endotrectomy versus 10 place group. But it's a cumulative endpoint. Any stroke, myocardial infarction or death within one month, or ipsilateral stroke over the next few years, four years. So if you compare the numbers, the rate is the same in stent group versus endotrectomy group. But actually break it down, the rate of myocardial infarction was higher in the group that got endotrectomy, and the rate of stroke within one month was higher in the group that got the stent placement, even though the total aggregate number is the same. But it's still important for people to know what the distribution was. So you have to describe the endpoints or the distribution or composition of the endpoints. And then usually the comparison, you know, most times it's univariate comparison. A lot of people actually are doing multivariate comparison because of these readily available software. And then if you're doing multivariate comparison, make sure that you know what variables you've entered and why you've entered them. They have to be prognostically important variables. And the same is true for the secondary and ancillary measures. So let's say that modified Rankine scale was your primary endpoint, but there's a bunch of secondary endpoints, neurological improvement within 24 hours, neurological deterioration within 24 hours, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages. So those are all secondary endpoints and they actually have to be described as well. And if you're doing comparison, then you have to mention the comparison as well. And now subgroup analysis. Most clinical trials actually have to specify the subgroup they will analyze even before the trial is started. They have to use the existing data to define those subgroups, whether it's actually defined by age, 80 years or greater, less than 80, whether it's defined by the severity of different neurological deficits, NIS stroke scale of 10 or greater versus less than 10, and essentially, you have to define the comparison of endpoints in these subgroups. And a lot of people are actually using figures to describe the whole subgroup analysis to make sure that the results, the primary result, did not differ according to subgroups. So that is actually the methodology. And I strongly encourage you to use subheadings because that way you can organize your results. Otherwise, it's hard to put all of the results in some organized manner. And the more disorganized you are, more likely the people reading will be disenchanted and more likely that the message may be lost. So obviously the discussion section, you know, many times I've wondered, do we even need a discussion section? If you actually have the results, you've already told people what you've found, why do you need to discuss those findings? But I think that there is a, perhaps some value in the discussion section you are actually saving the reader a considerable amount of effort by writing the discussion section. Now the discussion section actually has six subheadings. Some journals will actually have a little different distribution of subheading. But again, I strongly encourage you to use subheadings for your discussion. The first paragraph, salient finding, just summarize some of the findings that you think are the most important finding. If your finding is that death or disability was reduced in a particular subgroup of patient, then that is your salient finding. Now, the second paragraph is how does it compare with other studies? Obviously, there have been other studies on the same topic. They may be smaller studies, they may be retrospective study, but there have been other studies on the same topic. So how does it differ? Are your results exactly comparable to the other studies? Or are they different from the other study? If they're actually different or, you know, if there's concurrence or discrepancy, try to find the explanation. You know, sometimes smaller studies that don't have independent ascertainment, single center study are more likely to be biased as compared to multi-center studies with independent ascertainment. And that's why the results may actually differ. It's always surprised me that, you know, if you are self-ascertaining your endpoints, versus if somebody independent is ascertaining your endpoint, even in the same group of patients, the results or the proportion of endpoints will be different. And actually there have been studies on this topic showing that it can actually differ. And in that rectomy studies, 
if you look at yourself as a trend complication, you will be describing a rate of three to four percent. If somebody else is looking at it, they will actually take the rate to seven percent in the same group of patients. So I think that you know sometimes it's just who ascertained the endpoint, and whether the definition of endpoint were different may actually explain the difference between the other study. Now explanation for the findings. Sometimes you have to put a mechanism. Many years ago, when it's almost like twenty-five years ago. We actually were doing experimental models of intracerebral hemorrhage, and we were trying to find perihematoma ischemia. Most of you probably even haven't heard of the term of perihematoma ischemia. But 25 years ago, that was the most important thing in intracerebral hemorrhage. The intracerebral hemorrhage by compression of surrounding microvessels were actually inducing a zone of ischemia, and therefore blood pressure cannot be reduced because you can only provoke further ischemia. Now. We actually did experimental models. We couldn't find any ischemia, so obviously we can say there is no ischemia. But could there be a potential reason why we are not fighting ischemia? And the reason was that most studies that actually described ischemia were simply inflating the balloon in the brain parenchyma, so you have a sharp interface between the balloon and the surrounding parenchyma. When you actually have hemorrhage, it's not a sharp interface. In fact, the hemorrhage actually moves. Almost like a serpentine finger-like projection into the parenchyma. So the parenchyma and hemorrhage are far more intermingled without a sharp interface. And we actually found references from pathological studies in the 50s and the 60s that actually supported that concept that there was no sharp interface. And that is why there could be no compression or a surrounding well, you know, region of ischemia because the sharp interface never existed. So that is actually a mechanistic description of. Why your findings are what they are. Sometimes the finding may simply be because the design of the study dictated it. Then is implications for findings. You have these findings. What does it really mean? Sometimes the implication may be practice based. For example, one study we did we found an intracerebral hemorrhage rate in patients who get intravenous thrombolysis when they have infective endocarditis are very high. So what the implications are that patients who have infective endocarditis. Perhaps you need to be very cautious in giving them intravenous thrombolysis, even when they are presenting with ischemic stroke. Uh, sometimes it may be research-based that perhaps a particular study, for example, let's say the experimental model of intracerebral hemorrhage. What is the research hypothesis or implication? The research implications are that perhaps we need to study the same phenomena in patients now. Do clinical studies in patients where actually was done that patients were studied using positron emission tomography, replicating the result that we had actually found in the experimental model. So sometimes the implication is a practice-based implication. Sometimes it may actually be a research-based implication. And then data interpretation issue. You know we all think that our study is the greatest study that was ever done, and after that there can be no further study. But unfortunately, that's never true. Every study, the most carefully designed studies have limitation, and we have to mention those limitation. What do we think are the limitation of the study? Like for example, we did the ATAC2 study, a prospectively designed study. Months and years were spent in the design of the study itself. So one would think that it would have no problem, but nonetheless, it still had design limitation. One. That the intensive treatment group actually was more intensive than we had initially anticipated. The blood pressure reduction was greater than what we had thought would be in the intensive systolic blood pressure reduction group. Second, a larger portion of good grade patients got included. We thought that there would be equal distribution of good grade and moderate grade severity into cerebral hemorrhage, but unfortunately, that was not the case. Most patients were good grade patients. In fact, 70% of the patient had a Glasgow Coma Scale of 15. And that was not the intent of the study, but this, nonetheless, when it all played out, that's how the distribution of the patients was. Sometimes there may be conduct limitation. Uh, the patient recruitment was suboptimal. Sometimes the treatment application was suboptimal. But nonetheless, we have to mention those design limitations, or I guess uh, limitations when you actually are interpreting the data. But we also have to say why they are not fatal flaws, despite the limitation. There is some valuable. Interpretation of some valuable interpretation or information in the study itself, and then obviously we have to describe why we think this is not a fatal flaw and the study is still valuable. 
and obviously conclusion some journals want a conclusion some journal may not want a conclusion some journal want a conclusion that different than the conclusion of your abstract but conclusions are again similar to the format in the abstract summarize what their main findings are summarize what the implications of these findings are now one of the things that you know in design or discussion is the question about interpretation for example older people have worse outcomes that is actually a statement older patients with ischemic stroke have worse outcome it's a recognition but when you actually start saying that because age actually is the important determinant of outcome we have to be a little bit more cautious could it be truly be a cause effect relationship or it could be a simultaneous effect relationship for example people who are older are more likely to have strokes so people who are more likely to have more severe stroke so age did not contribute to the outcome just other factors contributed and again like a bystander relationship and this is a classic issue when patient with patent forum and avail have ischemic stroke patent forum and avail is so common patent forum and avail have nothing to do with the ischemic stroke just because it's a common entity it was seen in patient with ischemic stroke and sometimes it may be affect of various relationship uh, but nonetheless if you're going to define something as cause effect relationship you have to test an intervention to modify the cause and if modifies the effect only then you can say it's a cause effect relationship and then essentially you may have to do further test to apply the intervention and monitor the results of the intervention so i think i just want to stress out that just because two things are found together in an observational study don't actually directly or assume that there is a cause effect relationship it may just be a bystander relationship or maybe both things are actually being caused by a common etiology and that's not a cause effect relationship they are both consequences of a common etiology and i think that you know if you look at discussions the two most important things that are actually considered fatal flaws in discussion drawing conclusion that are not supported by the results your result may have shown something else and then for example you showed intravenous tpa was beneficial in patients who were treated within 3 hours but your conclusion that intravenous tp is beneficial in patient with ischemic stroke that is actually not the proper conclusion because the results were on a very selected group of patients and claiming the impact of results to be greater than what can be justified after considering the various limitation of the study you cannot tell people based on a retrospective study that they should modify their practices something is no longer applicable anymore because a retrospective study has its bias it is actually more like a hypothesis generating conclusion rather than a practice or modifying conclusion so i think this is two important things to know when you're actually writing a discussion don't overdo it uh, both in terms of saying what you're saying and don't make overdo it in some of the recommendation based on the study and obviously you have to make tables it's very almost all studies need tables but i'm actually always surprised that the format of table is so suboptimal when people are actually drawing the table the table actually has to have a proper format you have to have a title you know many people don't even put a title on the table but as you have your number table 1 table 1a table 1b whatever that is and then you have to actually have a content description what are the rows that are standing for what are the columns that are standing for and if you're using any abbreviation or symbol you have to describe them on the below or the bottom of the table and the same actually goes for figures figures actually i'm always surprised that why people don't put a legend or a title for the figure why people don't describe the abbreviation that are used in the figure because we have to put that in there so anybody who's actually looking at the figure who doesn't have the background that you have should at least be knowing at what he is actually looking at and a lot of time people actually highlight the findings in the figure as well so when you look at the figure and you read the title below you are familiar with what to interpret or what to actually take out of that figure now the word figure is very broadly defined unlike tables where it's a pretty homogeneous entity figures are a whole heterogeneous group of things um it can be graphs it can be plots it can actually be pictures 
it can be pictures of imaging photographs of imaging sometimes photographs of individuals it can actually be photographs of histo micro morphology or histology so obviously there is a whole set of figures that go in there and you have to actually describe it um you know you have to actually mention the details about the figure if you actually have a figure of a person you have to mention it took it by permission of the person and you have removed the de ident or identifying feature if it's actually a figure of histology you actually have to mention the magnification that was used whether it was 200 magnification 100 magnification special stains that were used and similarly um you know sometimes a lot of journals actually require a figure for patient flow you say you know reviewed 100 charts 75 of them met the criteria 25 of them actually met the patient that you were actually looking for 20 of them actually had complete data so they are actually asking you to make a figure so they don't have to read and make understand they can just look at the figure and understand how the flow of the patients was and again same is actually for modeling and comparisons this use of the time need advanced software and if you're using advanced software the soft will were actually plot the figure um, and also i strongly recommend that when you're writing the legends increase the font of the legend so people can actually read it if the font of the legends or even sometimes table is so small people cannot read what those legends or the or get the axis the units of the axis and actually the values of the axis so i think that there is a almost like a beautification process for figures as well so when you make those figures step back and look at it and see how can in, in or enhance the quality of the figures so now you have your manuscript you actually submit the manuscript what is the most likely of these fight of outcome we are not in person because i usually ask people to have a show of hands what do you think you have submitted a manuscript what is the most likely or like the greater likelihood what is of these five or six categories the response will be i know for the manuscript i submit the most likely response is number 1 reject so if you get the same response you are you know the same category that i am if you get anything else you are better than i am so that's good to know so reject is the category where you can get a response and that is pretty much the end for that particular journal but it's not the end for your manuscript you can always get a manuscript submitted to another journal and get accepted in my personal experience is usually two or three submissions to different journals before the manuscript is accepted so don't have you know have a heartbreak over it just simply say if there's anything valuable to be fixed and just resubmit it to another journal rejections are many times sometimes it's the quality of the study sometimes it may be the priority of the journal the journal just doesn't like that topic so essentially don't actually you know take a rejection hard um you know sleep over it get back the next day and just resubmit the manuscript sometimes is reject and resubmit which to me means resubmit uh, essentially fix it and resubmit you know major revision minor revision also obviously is a much much better chance that the mag you know the journal actually would accept your manuscript except for minor changes um again that's a very good omen except without any changes and i actually have like 790 publication there's only two publications in there that were accepted without any change only two so if you learn this is going to be your satisfactory end point modify your expectations now it's very very rare that you would actually get a letter saying they don't want any changes they want to accept the manuscript as it is so look at the following outcomes and simply titrate your expectation so that it doesn't become a end all or a be all statement for you when you get the recommendation so when the reviewer's response come you have to write a response to the reviewer you have to address each point step by step and in the book that you have i've given some examples how to respond to the reviewer when i've seen you know i've been a reviewer myself for many journals and i've seen responses that kind of vary from you know the reviewer has made an excellent suggestion to the reviewer has nothing valuable to say and trust me to the reviewer this is a special offense if you say the word the reviewer has nothing valuable to say you can be sure that reviewer is going to give the lowest priority ever so it's better to acknowledge 
what reviewer is saying and take it for face value and say that there is something valuable that actually needs to be addressed. And a lot of time, you know, they may actually have recommendations that, you know, usually take about the objectives, mainly they're trying to get a sense is this a valuable thing to do or not. And a lot of people who are familiar with the literature can justify it's a valuable thing to do or not. Um, methods use. Now, in objective, there's always that question about fatal flaw. The reviewer may just think that we already know the answer to that. And that actually happens in certain opinionated journals where reviewers are just, I like this question, I don't like this question, I'm done. Um, and similarly with the methods. Methods can also have fatal flaws. For example, if you're using to determine an endpoint using an estimated methodology that's highly flawed, then it's a fatal flaw. And regardless of what you do, the reviewer has already decided or what you have done is not gonna get accepted. But doesn't mean that other journal may not accept it. Other journal may still be, accepted, be accepting of your methodology. And the accuracy of the results. If there is any suspicion that your results are not accurate, that is an automatic rejection. This is a fatal flaw. It cannot be redeemed. So now you will say, how does the reviewer know whether I'm presenting the result accurately or not? And the answer is something very simple. For example, you say there's 50 women and 50 men in the study, but the total number of patients is 105. The reviewer just simply added it up and said, there's something really wrong with what you're doing. How can 105 patients be only 50 men and 50 women? Unless you have said that in five, we couldn't determine the gender. So usually that you think simple things to determine whether the results are accurate or not. They don't have the data sheet. They don't have the Excel form. They don't have the software in front of them to run the analysis. Um, sometimes they can actually judge by the confident interval. You know, if your sample size is small and your confidence are very tight, they know it cannot be accurate. So they're using indirect measures to determine whether the results are accurate or not. And you can read your own result before you submit to make that ascertainment yourself. So I strongly encourage people when they submit, look at the results and step back. They're actually making sense or not. And similarly, the interpretation. The interpretation of the result is usually very rarely flawed. I mean, I told you the limitations in the interpretation. The reviewer may simply identify the same issues and ask you to reinterpret your result. And most of them, that means a revision. It will be very rare that the reviewer will say, the interpretation is flawed and this has to be a rejection. But the biggest, biggest reason where there is no coming back is if there's any question about the accuracy of the results. If there's any question, the data was not run accurately. That is a fatal flaw and there is no coming back. So when you write the response to the reviewer, the best things are things you can fix. The reviewer has actually asked you to do something and you can do the things. If the reviewer has said, analyze it this way, you can simply redo the analysis. That is the simplest fix and everybody is gonna end up happy. But sometimes it's a challenge. You cannot do that required action item. For example, the reviewer says, you know, collect this data. You can't go back and collect that data. That data was never collected. There's no way you can find that data. So now you have a challenge. You have to actually explain. So you can actually go back to the literature and say that this is what we know from the literature. And therefore we think that, you know, whatever we did is still accurate. Uh, and another solution is that you can simply say, well, yes, we can't do this, but it's a limitation and we will acknowledge it. We will acknowledge it in the discussion section that we did not collect data on this particular item or this data was not available in the chart and we acknowledge it, but we still think this is valuable information despite the fact that we couldn't do what you were asking us to do. And a lot of them that may be enough, but everything the reviewer said, there has to be an answer and something done in the manuscript to respond. You this, when you write a response to the letter, this is not a letter to the reviewer. This is actually modification in the manuscript based on the suggestion of the reviewer. So always every comment they have, try to do something in the manuscript that actually the reviewer actually to answer the reviewer's comment. And then again, sometimes, you know, you just can't address the command. Just don't have the data. Just don't have the resources to address it. Sometimes the patient consent may not allow it. And then you simply have to acknowledge this as a limitation. But these are actually some of the things for response to the reviewer. And you have to organize it in a way so when the reviewer reads it, 
he's happy you've done something valuable you've listened to him obviously any time you give somebody a comment or advice and they don't listen you're not going to be happy about it the reviewers are the same they're giving you advice and if you're not going to listen to it they're not going to be happy and they're going to make sure the manuscript has the lowest priority in their mind so i'm actually going to conclude here i didn't want it to be too long because i want to actually have a time for discourse and discussion but i hope i wanted to cover to make manuscript structured and organized and these subheadings will allow you to get to this point if you don't have the organization you will struggle with writing the manuscript you will struggle with putting all the information you have in an organized manner and a lot of time you may actually omit valuable information that you may come to regret later so here i'm going to conclude here with the following why should we publish and many of you are in the beginning part of your career and you're probably asking this question yourself should i actually publish why should i publish should i go through the or endure through the challenge of publication if i can actually accept even at this stage after 30 years of publication a rejection rate of 50% uh, i think that perhaps you also need to tailor your expectations that this is the, you know this is what the expectation is this is what the reality and i'm going to get through this reality i'm going to move forward with this reality this reality is not going to hold me back and many skip writing also one thing i did not mention but i probably should have tailor your expectations in general any achievement in life it's a set of stairs it's not a big jump and you know every time you write a manuscript your first manuscript getting accepted in the new england journal of medicine this is a very inappropriate expectation this is an expectation that's doomed to failure you can start with much smaller journal and work your way up and you have more publication you'd be in a better position to eventually publish in new england journal of medicine or lancet or another high impact journal but don't actually expect the first publication will be in the new england, new england journal of medicine or lancet but i think there's a broader view of why we should publish i think that it actually plays into our own existence it actually is an important part of our own existence because it's allowing you to express yourself allowing you to have an opinion that other people can listen to and actually benefit from that opinion and to learn from what exists in residency you know i really very rarely studied textbooks but i did write manuscripts so every time i was writing manuscript i was reading all that was already published so my knowledge is very up to date on what was already known about the field before writing a manuscript so in some ways writing a manuscript is also a very good opportunity to know what's already out there and keeping your knowledge up to date obviously it's to share with others we always share things with others sometimes we share our resources sometimes our finances our wealth but we also have to share our knowledge and i think that's the most important thing to share knowledge i think that one of the saying is that you give it life to knowledge diet not so i think sharing knowledge with other individuals is a very important component of who we are and i think there is a bigger contribution to humanity that we are making every time we are publishing scientific manuscripts so i hope that you know this would motivate you and guide you to perform or write scientific manuscripts and publish scientific manuscripts well thank you very much thank you very much dr kureshi um for this excellent presentation um i'll open it up to questions uh people on zoom can uh, uh type in your questions dr kureshi i i i wanted to congratulate you i i didn't know the latest count has exceeded 750 now you're <laughs> 800 um so i apologize for saying 500 plus because uh, <laughs> no, no. it's uh, all relative uh, congratulations for doing that uh, you've been a uh, editor of a very successful journal for a long time uh, and uh, which is a which is a index journal um, and uh, uh, from from that experience of being an editor uh, how do you uh, usually manage the manuscripts do you 
Uh, do you, can you can you just give a like a, like a little sure. bit of a personal view of how you uh, judge a manuscript when it comes to you? I think that's an excellent question. I mean, um, so I've been an associate editor for the Journal of Neuroimaging. I've been on the editorial board for Stroke, and also been editor in chief for Journal of Vascular and Interventional Neurology, and then a more recent journal, a uh, healthcare research journal. Because of all the COVID nineteen research, we had to find something else. <laughs> so now. When you are a journal editor and you receive a manuscript, the first thing obviously is that you know you just read through the topic and decide is this an important question or not. And a lot of people have good questions. So you know, obviously, people who are writing manuscripts are qualified individuals, so they already have enough knowledge to determine what the good question is. So the next question, and I will tell you this: the most frustrating thing as a journal editor is the quality of write-up. A lot of people have valuable information in there, but the quality of write-up is so suboptimal that one has to say, well, if you have to rewrite the whole article, is it really worth all the time and the effort? So I think that, you know, if we can put more effort or anybody submitting in general can put more effort on improving the quality of write-up. And actually, I'm so surprised and, you know, sometimes people don't even use spell checks. And, you know, like so many softwares today, they would automatically identify these formatting issues. So I think that, the, you know, we don't have to be a major in English or a PhD in English. The software actually already do that. And also medical scientific writing is a little different than English writing. So I think that there is a certain unique aspect. Uh, but the only way to know that is read more articles. That's the only way you can learn what scientific writing is and how it differs from English writing. Uh, and then, you know, benefit from all the software out there. And I think that's an important issue that, uh, you know, with manuscripts, if the, the editors feel that it's just going to be too much of an effort, then sometimes even if the information is valuable, they kind of caught any crossroad, whether the whole effort that would be required to bring it to that standard may really be worth it or not. Uh, in our channel, we made an effort. We, a lot of time we tried to do extensive editing if the content is of value. Um, and a lot of time, you know, people actually, I think that um, at least some of the people who have done that have appreciated that. And I hope that you learn from it. So every time something is being edited, and even you know, you publish somewhere, we look at the galley proof and look at the edits that the, the, the I guess the proof reader or the proof editor has made and try to learn from it. So don't actually just simply take all the changes and just click, uh, click the button accept. Actually read through each change. So you're are looking learning from the changes that we've made. So next time you don't even have to have those changes somebody else making. You can do it yourself. And everybody starts at a lower level. Nobody was born with the skill. I mean, I think that the first time I wrote a manuscript, it took me like three months of just editing it and being embarrassed in front of all the faculty I showed it to. I, mean, I think that the first time I showed it to a faculty at Emory University, the advice I got was, maybe you need to take English classes. I still remember, and he's a very dear mentor, and we wrote many manuscripts down the line. First time I looked at manuscript, he said, my English is either A or B, but your English is a D. So I think that, but don't let it keep down. You can actually get to an A from that standpoint. So I think those would be some of the advice. Yeah. That's also a very good point that uh, looking at uh, what the journal wants uh, may help you a lot. Like looking at the previous journals and looking at what topics excite them or what topics interest them more. Uh, would make sure that you're sending it to the right journal that uh, the content is needed for. Uh, is that something that you look at uh, very uh, closely? You mean about the impact? Like the, the actual content of uh, the article is uh, along the lines of what you want for your uh, journal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think with, with the content, uh, obviously um, the main thing is the theme of the journal. So it has to be consistent with the theme um, and then and I think that's why we created the, the healthcare research journal because a lot of things that were coming in were good and good information, good science, um, but were not, not necessarily, uh, you know, what a journal of vascular intervention neurology would encompass. So sometimes uh, things can actually be outside the theme of what the journal is expected to cover. Um, and the problem is that the PubMed actually monitors that. So, um, you know, every time there's serial monitoring, they will actually look at the manuscript and make sure it's consistent with stated objective. Uh, of the, the journal. Uh, I think the journals are at increasing scrutiny now um, because there is this new term that has been coined, it's called the predatory journal. And it has been coined by the journal that should be classified as predatory journal. So basically these are journals that actually are taking money for publishing your work and 
uh, obviously, um, you know, it's almost like a profiteering. Um, you know, this journal directory is charging three thousand dollars for each publication. So, <laughs> if you're a rich person, that's a big challenge. <laughs> but actually, if you look at which journals are actually charging, a lot of the Lancet journals are charging that. <laughs> like journals who are charging just to actually review your manuscript. So I think that this is becoming a very business model, which I think is probably not fair to the scientific community. I mean, obviously, rich people are not the only people who have good scientific information. So I think that you know perhaps um, at some point the system should auto correct itself. Thank you very much again, Dr. Qureshi. Um, uh, there, there are no uh, more questions that I see. Um, uh, Dr. Qureshi, it was an excellent overview, very nicely broken down into each section. Uh, I think uh, the, all the trainees, the, the fellows, the junior faculty, all would benefit a lot from this uh, lecture. Thank you very much again. And we have distributed uh, your book to all the presenters. Uh, who had presented, um, and we do have a little token of appreciation for you. Oh, uh, I wish I could uh, hand this over uh, as our token of appreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, this plaque says that you're a keynote speaker at the 18th Annual Zakula Day, and uh, um, thank you very much again. Uh, we will mail this to you, uh, your plaque, um, uh, and thank you again for uh, coming. I know that you had a Busy day, you were in a case uh, just before uh, you came on Zoom. Uh, so thank you for making the time and giving us this valuable uh -huh. Yeah, I want to introduce a way who poor, poor, poor person, our student who actually put all the publication, <laughs> all the slides together. So, uh, and um, I think one thing I wanted to mention, I'm actually very interested in content seminars. So basically have a group of trainees and you know one person has written a manuscript and we all go over the manuscript together. And because, you know, once you actually have a actual content and you are actually going over the content with everybody else uh, and it has an interactive session. And I think that is even more helpful. So I think as these restrictions on COVID-19 are becoming less, perhaps it's something that we should consider doing together. Well, that'll be amazing. That'll be awesome. Would you be willing to do that? Like um, we send you the manuscript first, you review it and then critically discuss the manuscript. Well, thank you very much.